Good afternoon. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And I'd like to welcome you to our forum on Education Data Analytics. And we are webcasting uh, this event, so we'd also like to welcome our viewers from around the country as well as outside the United States. And we've set up a Twitter hashtag at TechCTI, that's TechCTI, so people can post comments and ask questions. And we will, in our Q&A period, take questions both from our audience here in the auditorium as well as our webcast audience. Schools suffer from uh, several limitations right now in terms of assessment. They provide little immediate feedback to students. They require teachers to spend hours grading routine assignments. And they fail to take advantage of innovative new technologies designed to improve the learning process. And these problems are unfortunate because data-driven approaches make it possible to study learning in real time and offer systematic feedback both to students as well as teachers. These so-called big data allow educators to mine information regarding student learning. And these te uh, techniques can analyze what students have retained and what uh, pedagogic uh, approaches are most effective for particular uh, students. Today, we are putting out a paper on recent advances in education analytics. Uh, there's a copy out in the hallway. If you uh, didn't get one on your way in, you can uh, pick it up on your uh, way out. This work was supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we're very uh, grateful to it for its financial support. And in the paper, I examine the potential for improved learning, evaluation, and accountability through data mining techniques and data analytics, as well as uh, web dashboards. These approaches make it possible to mine uh, learning information for insights regarding student performance and learning approaches. For example, uh, there are schools in 16 states now that are employing data mining techniques to identify at-risk uh, students. They use prediction models based on truancy, disciplinary problems, changes in course performance, and overall grades to identify students who are at risk of dropping out of high school. For example, the school district in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, uses a risk factor a scorecard to identify who is at risk and who is in need of special attention. In terms of higher ed, we're also seeing some interesting applications. Arizona State University, uh, for example, has an e-advisor system in which freshmen choose uh, one of five broad areas of study, such as arts and sciences or science and engineering, as their designated course of study. And if the students perform poorly, poorly in a required class or if they miss a course in a particular required sequence, the software identifies them as off track and sends them to an advisor to hopefully get them back on track so that they can uh, find the area of uh, interest that is best suited uh, for them. There also are examples of where we're starting to get into the details of actual learning, uh, where when students are learning through computer modules, there's software that can basically track how quickly they're picking up on key concepts, what their proficiency is as they read materials or solve math uh, problems, uh, so that teachers and professors can keep track, not just in terms of like giving them a test once a month and then saying, yeah, you got an 80 or a 90 here, but really looking at uh, learning in a very nuanced way and providing uh, feedback uh, based on uh, that information. So there's really been an explosion of new technologies and new innovations uh, that we think are very uh, valuable. To help us develop a better understanding of this subject, we put together a distinguished set of speakers. Uh, Patty Barth is the director of the Center for Public Education of the National School Boards Association. Uh, the center provides practical information and analysis about uh, the successes and challenges of facing U.S. public schools. Prior to joining the National School Boards Association, she worked at the Education Trust as a senior associate focused on standards, assessments, and accountability. She's the author of several reports. A few months ago, uh, she uh, and her colleagues put out a report on virtual learning and charter schools. Karen Kator is director of the Office of Educational Technology in the U.S. Department of Education. She works to create the best possible learning environment for students. Prior to this position, she directed Apple's leadership and advocacy efforts in education. 
She has great expertise about the connection between education policy and emerging technologies. Her office put out a report earlier this year entitled Enhancing Teaching and Learning Through Educational Data Mining and Learning and Analytics. Jose Ferrara is a founder and CEO of Newton, an adaptive learning company. He and his colleagues use a cloud-based platform that analyzes concept-level data to personalize learning and really get into the nitty-gritty of the learning process. This then helps educators tailor their content to the needs of specific students. The company was named a technology pioneer uh, last year by the World Economic Forum at uh, Davos. It also has a partnership with Pearson to work on digital higher education uh, products in North America that by next year will allow them to reach over 10 million uh, students. So the format of our uh, panel is I will pose some opening questions to our panel about the uses, the po possible benefits, and the barriers and obstacles to uh, data analytics. Then we will open the floor to questions both from our live audience as well as our uh, webcast audience. So I'll start with uh, Karen. So, uh, you have uh, worked uh, extensively on uh, virtual learning, on data mining, uh, and on learning uh, analytics. How are schools starting to uh, use uh, these types of things? What are the most promising uh, applications? And what does your experience uh, tell us about data analytics? Yes. Hello. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me here today and um, looking forward to this conversation. Um, so we have been looking a lot at, um, at not only the challenges that schools have, but the tremendous opportunity that schools have now as we move into this digital world, as we begin to um, have a personal learning environment where students are, are working through materials at their own pace. They're going to have differentiated access to um, interventions or strategies to help them understand, gain concepts. They're going to have increased interaction with other people and we'll be able to, to manage and, and look at some of this data online to understand not just kind of what you know about things, but also who you're interacting with and that kind of thing. Um, we, we're going to begin to have tremendous opportunity to understand so much more, not just about, we'll understand so much more about who you are as a learner and what kinds of things will help you progress, but we'll also begin to learn more about how people learn, what's the nature of learning progressions, um, you know, what are the varieties of ways that people um, go through uh, the um, various learning um, uh, uh, standards and that kind of thing. So there's a tremendous opportunity, and it is kind of because we're, we're uh, flipping to a, a digital world. We've, we have been, as we say, kind of data poor. And I know some people sort of uh, don't necessarily believe that. They feel like we've had a lot of data in education, but we really haven't. We've had test scores. We've had grades, you know. Um, attendance, you know, administrative data, but not a lot of data about kind of day-to-day -day, um, management. And I know uh, Jose will be able to talk very specifically about the kinds of things that we'll be able to do. So we're, gonna, we're going from sort of a, a situation where we've sort of been data poor to a situation where we're going to be very data rich. So as we begin to think about the trends of move to mobile, much more digital content, much more digital assessment, much more um, social interaction online, um, we're, we will get to this space of what, having what we call big data. So this whole world of learning analytics kind of revolves around the fact that we will have these big data sets and looking at the various uh, techniques that have been applied in other sectors, potentially the consumer sector and, and other in financial sector, um, other sectors to understand how people look at big data sets and what they do with them. So things, for example, like uh, data visualization, be able, being able to take, you know, great big sets of data, and only when you, you present them in a visual format can kind of humans be able to make judgments and interact with that data in a, a, a meaningful fashion. Um, I'm not going to say too much more because I know we have a, a lively discussion uh, to ensue here, but um, the, what I would say is that the, um, the ability, there, there are many opportunities, there are some barriers, there are some things that we have to uh, laser focus on to make sure that we don't kind of lose the opportunity as we, as we move forward. Um, and I uh, look forward to the conversation. Okay, uh, thank you. Patty, uh, could you address the different audiences uh, for uh, data analytics in terms of students, teachers, parents, and policymakers? I mean, some of these people are used to dealing with data, some of them are not used to uh, dealing with uh, data. Uh, what are the particular uh, challenges as well as the opportunities for okay. the different yeah, audiences? Certainly, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm just uh, really very honored to be here at Brookings. Um, 
Yes, I mean, and, and we're going to hear a lot about the classroom level and the student level uh, and what teachers can do with that, and that's very exciting. But uh, there are different audiences, as Daryl said, for using all this data that we have. And uh, I'm going to pull us up a little bit and talk about what it means for a school district and these uh, different audiences. Um, we, we have had data in schools for policymaking for a long time. I love this phrase, data poor. Uh, the, the problem is the data wasn't always very good. Uh, it was uh, flat test scores, you know, maybe NRTs, SAT, ACT, attendance maybe, graduation rates, maybe college going. Uh, the big problem is that mostly what, uh, what we had were um, overall average scores. And I don't have to tell this group what averages can hide. As one of my colleagues likes to say, if you have your head in the refrigerator and your feet on the stove, on average, you're very comfortable, right? <laughs> and uh, yet that doesn't really describe what you're going through at that moment. And that's what the averages have been hiding. We know this, uh, you know, that many districts, once we started disaggregating data, uh, high performing or uh, districts that thought they were doing pretty well, in fact, there were some achievement gaps that was hiding in the averages. Uh, even something like attendance, you can have you know, 85%, 90% attendance rates, but maybe that 10% is chronically absent, which is a, a real early warning sign of, of students in trouble. So now technology has enabled us to uh, not only collect all this data, but uh, to be able to organize it in, in ways that we can look at uh, a more complete picture of what is going on in a school. And uh, we may be, we'll probably be talking about a lot of those as the conversation goes on. Some of the problems, though, the abundance of data has problems of its own, and that is people in schools, whether you're a school board member or you're a classroom teacher or a principal in the central office, not many of them are statisticians. And they haven't necessarily been trained to use data. So what do they do now that they have all this data? How do you find what is going to tell you, what is going to answer the question you have right now? Where are you going to be able to see where your needs are so you can start pushing resources in those directions? It can be overwhelming. Uh, the need for professional development is very, very uh, urgent and uh, uh, necessary. Um, the other issue, access, you know, who has access for two different levels of data. Uh, the kind of data that um, Karen referred to and, and what Jose is working with, very important for teachers. You don't necessarily want your school board looking at that data, right? So how do you uh, provide the right access so people are getting what they need, but they're not, get, they're not becoming micromanagers? Uh, and the improvements in the technology and data dashboards uh, do a lot of that work for you. They, uh, some of the best ones out there, I'm, I'm just absolutely wowed by the Colorado Department of Ed. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, but a really, really a very friendly, attractive display of taking a lot of data points, putting them together very, um, in, in, a, in a real, I, I call it like a happy display, that even the most math-phobic person can look at that and get the information they need. And I, you know that is uh, creating a, a, a huge contribution uh, to uh, helping, helping uh, educators use data better, and parents as well. One issue I, I, want to, I, want, I want to raise right now, and I don't want us to lose sight of it, but uh, uh, all of this data has brought more transparency into the conduct of schools, which in general is a very good thing. Um, but at the same time, it has made a lot of educators very nervous because there are, everything is exposed right now. And I think we have to keep the human factor in mind as we talk about using data and making it available. This is really calling for strong leadership at the local level. Uh, they're the ones who are going to have to provide that support for teachers, make them feel comfortable. Something when I talk about this, I, I use a data caution meter based on, uh, remember we had that, uh, the Homeland Security 
uh, level, color levels. And, you know, based on stakes, if it's low stakes, it's a low level of caution. You know, people can get comfortable in it, get used to it, start making it useful for them. But as the stakes go up, you've got to be aware that the fear level goes up too. And so school leaders need to be mindful of that and make educators feel comfortable, help them to trust the data, which they don't necessarily do right now. And they'll eventually see the real power in using this. Uh, and along with that, parents and community need to be brought into this too. Uh, that data is out there. It's out there for them. And if you don't involve them, they're going to see that data anyway. You know, so I think it's much better to have them with you at the, at the get-go than to have them come back at you later. So bring them in. Have these data conversations throughout the community. Uh, and again, build up that trust, keeping in mind that what all of us want is to see our, our kids do well in school, graduate from high school, ready for their next steps. Thank you. Uh, Jose, uh, you and your <coughs> colleagues at Newton have really gotten into the nuances of learning and through your uh, software platforms can really track learning in very detailed sorts of ways. And I think a lot of people don't realize exactly how far the technology has evolved even today. So can you give us a sense of what some of the possibilities uh, are uh, today? Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Jose Ferreira. Uh, in case you're wondering, it's Portuguese, uh, but it's all like Jose. Uh, and um, I guess my role on the panel is to talk about the future of what big data can do. Um, you know, the data that we've collected in education up until now has been you know, grade book and attendance and things like that. And that's not a lot of data, data per user. Per student, that's not very much data. Um, that's what Karen means by data poor. Um, on, on aggregate, we get a lot of data um, at a district level um, or it seems like a lot because there's so many data points. It's not very much per user, but we try to tease out what, you know, what we can. Um, what we can do going forward is quite a bit more um, powerful if we can get it right. Um, what we can do is take advantage of um, the fact that students are increasingly accessing educational materials online. Um, smartphone, iPad, laptop. And, and that's going to increase, whether it's supplemental products, it's their new online textbook that they just happen to be reading on an iPad instead of in print. Um, and what that means is we can suddenly capture lots of data if we've set the products up right. So what my company does is, is uh, work with publishers. To get, they tag all of their content to this one set of standards. And they tag their content down to the sentence, sometimes in some cases down to the word. They tag every little bit of their content, um, which means they tell us what, it, what it's about. This sentence is about this concept. This practice question is this difficult. It's, it's a word problem. It's a whatever. Um, and they tag it down to the atomic concepts. They tag it down to a level below which it's, you can't divide any further. It's so granular. And what that means is that um, whereas in other big data platforms like Google or Facebook, they might produce in the tens of data points per user per day, or other education platforms today produce in the ones, maybe the tens of education of, of actual data per user per day. Um, for my company, we're producing in the hundreds of thousands, and in some cases, the millions of actual data per student per day. So what, what, what that means is that Newton actually gets more data about our students than anybody else in the world gets about anybody, about anything, and it's not close. We, get, we know so much about our students. Within a few weeks, we know to the percentile what their proficiencies are at every concept in the course. We know how they learn best. They, le they learn math best in the morning, we'll know that. If they learn science best in 45 minute bite sizes, because at the 47 minute mark, their click rate always declines, we'll know that. If they learn something best with video clip instead of text or in addition to text, we'll know that. If they never retain that 35-minute burst they do at lunch, we can tell them, don't bother, go hang out with your friends. You learn that stuff best in the morning. We can tell them everything about what they know and how they learn best. Um, we can use this to pair them up with online study, study partners. Um, we're rolling out a feature next year um, called Adaptive Tutoring. We'll have, like, um, like Daryl said, 10 million Pearson students alone next year, probably a lot, a lot more. Um, we, can go, we can let you ask a question, type it into a search box, tag the question. Then we can go find everybody who's online right this second who absolutely positively knows the answer to that question because we know exactly how well they're doing. They're top 3% in the nation at those, at those nodes, at those concepts. Let's go subdivide. Let's find the people whose learning style is just like yours. Right? Those are the people who can probably explain it to you the best. Let's subdivide again. Let's find the people whose learning style is just like yours, who are absolutely masters of that material, who learned it the easiest. They have the easiest path to, to mastery. Maybe those are the people who can say, oh, for people like us, they wouldn't put it this way, but for people just like us, here's what works the best. Go do that. 
right? And I can take your, I can take the combined data power of a network of tens of millions of people, data mine it, take the wisdom of crowds, and apply this concept level of adaptive intelligence to it, and find the perfect ten people online right this second to answer your question for you. That's what that's what the big data in education is about to start doing. So it's clear from listening to each of the three, there's a very exciting innovation uh, taking place. I have a question for uh, anyone on the panel can uh, jump in. Each of you I did identify certain problems. Uh, Karen, you mentioned uh, education is data poor in uh, general, uh, unlike some other areas. Uh, each of you uh, alluded to uh, various policy barriers. Uh, there are seat time problems, uh, issues of transfer credit. There are technology issues in terms of interoperability. A lot of school districts still silo uh, their data, and then it's hard to get the different IT systems to uh, talk to uh, one another. And then there's a question of privacy and access and who should uh, be able to see uh, various uh, parts of this. So given the range of problems that we have, how do we overcome these? What are examples of how school districts are starting to address these types of issues? Any of you want to jump in? And don't be shy. You're among friends. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think that there are, um, I think there are, there's work being done at multiple levels, right? So the, so the kinds of things that we need to do, so you, you listed a lot of the challenges, the things to keep in mind, the things to think about, and, and you know, absolutely right, and we probably could come up with more or whatever, but just starting even with those. So we need, um, first of all, we need people, we need sort of a new, uh, uh, a new, the new capacity of data scientists or date learning data scientists or you know the the kinds of people who understand you know statistics plus machine learning, um, you know maybe um, psychometrics. I mean, and I think probably Jose has a few of those. You probably would like some more to find those people. The, the places that I know that have have found um, folks to come into their organization to help them with this, they're finding them in the financial sector. Right, so people that, that understand big data are not coming from our schools of education or our um, uh, or, or the like. So we're so that's the first thing we need: more data scientists. We need to we need to ratchet up the understanding of the space. We need a, a, other kinds of research. So there's there's a lot that we need sort of in the research space. In the commercial sector, we need um, much more design and development, like what what Jose is talking about. There are there are several companies that we know about that are working on. Uh, platforms or environments that are going to leverage uh, big data, that leverage the kinds of data that we're talking about, the, the clickstream data to the outcome data to the who you're connected with data to, um, you know, every, as, as we say, all of the data about you as a learner. Um, so I think we need that. On the policy side of things, we definitely need to understand much more about um, the kinds of policies that are going to keep very close in mind things like privacy and information security. So we need to pay very close attention to those things while we are making sure that the people who need information have information. So actually, like part of the conversation is stop, you know, moving from talking about data to talking about the information you need to make decisions. One of the things that we've been working on is thinking about the and the student is actually, you know, should be the keeper and the, the like the audience for much of this information. As we can begin to help students and parents and teachers know much more about how we're progressing and how how you're learning, that's going to be uh, uh, very empowering. So from so there are sort of research kinds of things and preparation kinds of things. There are commercial um, sector kinds of things. There are education um, types of things, and then there are really end user. Um, understanding about this data, how to keep my own data safe, and this is across multiple sectors, but in education as we move to this, helping students and parents understand what this data is, what it means, where it came from, what you can do about it, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and there's, there's, there's more. One of the things I will say is um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hopeful that we can move from a situation where we're trying to get educators to be data analysts to a situation where we can provide the actual actionable information to educators based on the data. So in the past, what we've been doing is saying, look at this great data dashboard, look at all this data. You know, now we'll spend a few days of professional development to teach you what to do about it. And what we need to get to is the point where the, the platform actually tells you what to do about it so that you are much closer to the action uh, end of things. Patty, you want to jump in on how oh. we overcome policy and operational problems? 
Well, uh, yes, actually, and I, I agree. It, it is uh, it, it is an issue that uh, has has multiple players and, of course, multiple uh, uh, solutions to it as well. There's a lot of work that has to be done on a lot of levels. I think the design issue, very big, and uh, I, I'm I'm so optimistic at, at what is happening right now that that's a problem that can be solved. Uh, the interoperability. Uh, you know, between the state and the district, trying to get that data back in a timely fashion, data in different places. We made references to silos. Uh, it's, it's important to solve that problem, but when we solve that, the want to keep in mind that uh, right now we do have data systems, but they are so varied. Uh, you have it at the state. You have some districts that have fabulous data systems. You have some districts without any data system. You have some with not very good data systems, uh, but they're there. And one thing all districts are right now is broke. And so when we get the, we unleash these designers, uh, one thing I hope they will keep in mind is how can we do this uh, efficiently and effectively? You know, it's that cheap, easy, effective solution. And I think they can do it. We saw some of it in Georgia where they, uh, they were able, without a lot of resource investment, to um, develop code where the districts could uh, import the state data very effectively. I mean, you know, those are the kinds of things that would be a huge help in, um, in bringing and breaking down those silos. Jose, how do we overcome these barriers? Mm. So I think the, the, one of the biggest barriers is the whole model of education historically and, and up until now in the United States has been a task-based model. It's been about hours and seats. And, um, you know, like when we were in school, did you do your homework? Well, I read the chapter and I did the question, so I guess I did my homework. Well, I may not have understood any of that stuff, right? What if someone didn't do any of the homework but understood all those concepts? Did that person do the homework? Right? We're moving into a world where education is going to be about proficiency. Um, and we're, Newton, my company, is moving us into that world, and, and so are others. So you mentioned Arizona State. They're a, a big Newton customer. And um, they've wrestled with this problem pretty aggressively because we're telling them things like, hey, this, you know, um, this student can, can get an A in your final right now. You know, it's two weeks into the course. You can keep her in the course if you want. That's what you always did. That's what everybody always did. But it's kind of pointless. It's alienating for her. It's a waste of your resources. Right? So we've had students finish courses at ASU in 14 days. Right. We've had others who needed two semesters to finish the entire course. So there's a, the path to success for everybody, but, um, but what happens when you shift from a task-based model, which is about hours and, and pages of reading, to a proficiency-based model, which is just literally, do you know it? I don't care how you know it. I just want to know if you know it and how well. Um, because the whole world of education is going to shift to that model. The model never existed before because we could never get the data out. We never could tell if they knew it. Now we can tell. We're going to be able to get the data out, and the whole model is going to shift because all these proxies we used to use, like hours and seats, those were just proxies. That's all they ever were, and those proxies are going to go away because we got the we got the real thing. And so the whole regulatory environment. I mean, you know, um, ASU they had to jump through all kinds of hoops to satisfy creditors that these students who weren't doing enough hours in the course actually should be able to get a grade in the course. These students were like straight A students in these courses. So um, there's a lot of arbitrary regulatory framework. Um, that wasn't arbitrary before now, but is now outdated, that is going to have to catch up. Okay, uh, why don't we open the floor to uh, questions from the audience as well as our uh, webcast audience. Uh, so if you could uh, raise your hand, uh, give us your uh, name and your organization, and <coughs> we'd ask you to keep your questions brief so we can get to as many people as uh, possible. Um, my name's Ann Miller. I work for Frontier 21. I've been a teacher for two years. Oh, and we have a microphone oh. coming over to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, my name's Ann Miller. I work for Frontier 21. Um, I'm a researcher, and I'm uh, helping uh, roll out iPads into the classroom. Uh, my question uh, has to do with the proficiency. Um, you know, we hear the bad things about uh, teaching to the test and whatnot. Um, obviously, we have, uh, we'll have a set of criteria that will determine whether a student is proficient or not. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how do we walk that line between teaching to the criteria and a student actually understanding the, the concepts and the, the, the linkages behind the actual, yeah, you know what I mean. Yep. <laughs> so totally great question. Thank you, Anne. Um, um, so I would say that I don't really care what the, what the criteria are. Um, 
every school or college should be, or professor or teacher should be, continue to be free to make their own, I, I have no opinion on that. They should make their own criteria still, set their own standards, um, or if they do, if they make those standards at the school level or state level, other people can make those choices and they can be the same people who currently make them. I, I'm not an expert in who, who should make those choices. Um, but whoever, who, whoever's making those choices and whatever the criteria are, I'll still be able to tell people, give this student the final right now. Whether the final is an essay or the final is whatever, she's ready. So, I mean, it just doesn't, it's, it obviously doesn't make any sense that, that 100 strangers or 30 strangers are all going to start at, at one starting point and end at the exact same starting point. That, that's obviously wrong. And we can now tell you um, when they're going to end. Mm -hmm. Can I say oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's a really important question. And the, the important point to remember is we don't have good assessments necessarily right now. And so we absolutely, it's another sort of thing we need to, as we move to a competency-based learning model, and we say we're going to have more data, more information about how people are doing, we need way better assessments. And there's actually an opportunity to create much better sort of performance assessments um, that will give us more information. If we went to a competency-based model and used our current set of tests at the end, I think we would leave a lot of very important learning on the cutting room floor. Because all of the interactions, the kinds of things that students learned potentially serendipitously or along the way as they were learning how to answer those specific questions on the test would get left behind. So we need really interesting, sort of m way more compelling performance uh, you know, <clears throat> assessments. And uh, you know, so if you think of a triangle, right, and you think about the, the criteria, the, the, what people need to know and be able to do. If you say that's going to be publicly available, be able to articulate, and we have in many cases, what people need to know and be able to do, whether it's to be a statistician, whether it's to be an electrician, whether it's to weatherize your house, whether it's to you know, be able to write this essay. If we articulate that, if we, in, in the other corner, we say there are lots of ways of learning this, and today there are a expanding and just exploding opportunities to learn things from other people online, from <coughs> books still, from your teacher still, from all sorts of uh, new uh, courses and environments that are, that are popping up online. So the opera how you learn that stuff, lots of different ways to do that. And so what we're talking about is this other corner that is that now how do we know you actually learned it? That's going to be the really interesting and I think that the space for tremendous innovation and tremendous sort of new work um, in the in the coming you know year couple of years is really figuring out those performance assessments. Yeah. I, yeah, I would just I think what you raise is so important because that reminds us of what really are we after? It's what kids know and can do, and yeah, that's why we're here. The technology helps us get there. The assessments help us get there. Uh, I will, I will admit that we don't have the greatest tests, but at the same time, I think we do have some pretty good ones out there. The technology is going to propel what we can do with assessment, uh, the formative that uh, Jose is talking about, the day-to-day, -day, and even the summative at the end of course, uh, really truly be testing worth teaching to. Right. You know, and, and when it is public, that people can easily see, oh, yes, this is exactly what uh, our children should know and can do. So it, it works together. But the first question is, was your question, Anne, that um, what is it, you know, what is it they should know? What are the criteria? So Anne has set a very high bar for asking questions. Like, everybody has praised. But this means we have to praise all the other questions so people don't feel badly like <laughs> they ask a stupid question or something. Uh, other uh, questions. It's in the a very back. now. In the very back on the aisle, yeah, there's a microphone right behind you. Hello, my name is Alex Williams, and I work with STEM Connector, and we focus on creating public partner, public private partnerships between corporations and organizations. And just the conversation so far has focused on, let's say, the K through 12 and the university space. What could or the potential be for ed tech in, let's say, retraining lifelong learners? Uh, there are a ton of manufacturing jobs, uh, just for an instance, out there, and there is a just a shortage of labor that just knows how to use it. So, can we just maybe talk about how ed tech can be used, maybe for later stage learners? God, that is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Yes, I mean, yes, it can be used for 
<laughs> Learners of all ages and stages. I mean, I think that's one of the really interesting things that this, potent, this move to digital will actually provide for us is we now sort of separate people out. Like, you're a fourth grader, and that's what fourth graders do. And you're a sixth grader. You're you know, a, a community college student or, or, and the like. And I think what we'll be able to do is have a, lots of opportunities to learn things in a variety of ways online and, and together and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I think this, it absolutely has a tremendous uh, application for, um, for uh, people wanting to learn, like I said, how to weatherize your house, how to become an accountant, how to be, you know, some of the, you know, nursing or whatever. This is absolutely not saying that, um, that the face-to-face -face interactions, that it replaces those, but it scaffolds those. It augments the, the interactions that we have live and, and in our classrooms and with other people. So it's just, again, this opportunity to learn lots of different kinds of things. So back to the previous comment, you articulate what you need to do and be able to do, whatever it is, it, at whatever stage you're at, you figure out all the different places that that's, you, you can learn that, and then you figure out what the performances are. In the later stage, when you're, also, when you're looking to perform or demonstrate performance so that you can get a job, then that, again, that corner of the performance is going to become more and more important because, because that's going to, or more and more valuable, I should say, because it will be more than saying, I took these five courses. It'll actually say, I can actually do this stuff. I can demonstrate. I have demonstrated. I have my you know, certificate, my badge, my, you know, whatever it is that you would get at the end of a performance assessment. So huge opportunities for all ages and stages. So I might just jump in um, quickly and say that um, there are two things that need to happen um, for the world that I think you and I would like to see happen, um, happens. Okay. Um, That's using the same word in one sentence, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> right. so um, first, there has to be a lot of online materials so that people who want to be retrained for career reasons or what have you have the ability to do so, right? Because, you know, Karen's right. I can't, I can't hire enough great data scientists. I can't even hire enough great programmers. I mean... Our Newton starting salary for a program right out of college is like eighty or something thousand dollars. I'm not even sure, but you know, when I was in college, if someone told me I could just study computer science instead of philosophy and make an eighty thousand dollar year living, I would have done that. I mean, I didn't really care. I mean, I did a little. You know, it's like there's we have an incredible shortage of, of programmers in this country right now. Software engineers, an incredible shortage. You know, like I I, I think we probably have three million too few, right? And um, and those are really good upper middle class jobs. So. People should be retraining for those. Anyway, uh, we need two things. We need a lot of online materials. So we need the ability to retrain. But then who's going to trust the materials, right? We need some sort of vetting. So that's where big data comes into it. Uh, I'll tell a funny story. A friend of mine, Tom Pinckney, um, is a, an entrepreneur in New York. And he, he co-founded um, Site Advisor and then Hunch. Tom didn't graduate from high school. He was a dropout. Um, when it con came, came time that he began to think about going to college, because that's what all of his friends were doing, he um, he wrote a bunch of code and sent it to MIT. He didn't send them his transcript or his SATs or anything. He just sent them code. And he got in and went to MIT. And he's a successful entrepreneur. So we need to make it much more possible for people to do things like that. Through And data can help that happen. When we'll be able to go to companies and say, I know this person didn't do X, Y, and Z, but this person is off the charts at these skills. We know that for a fact. Then um, you'll see companies hire those people. So you mentioned we need more online material. How are content providers retooling content for this new digital world, if, if at all? Um, well, there's, there's a, you know, a mundane and an elevated answer to that. The mundane answer is um, HTML5, not Flash, and because um, you know, of iPads. Um, and the elevated answer is um, don't have them read a PDF. That doesn't make any sense. The whole point is when you read a book online, you may as well do a lot more good stuff with it, right? I mean, Newton's whole point, the whole, what my company does, I don't even think I explained it, is we take textbooks or course materials and we dynamically generate the optimal bundle for each kid each day. So actually, instead of everybody having the exact same textbook from day one, starting on day one with Newton, everybody has a unique, it's not even a textbook anymore. It's a textbook plus video plus game plus whatever, but it's unique on day one. And um, that can work. Online, you can't do that in a bricks and mortar environment. You can give every single person a unique syllabus on day one, opt not arbitrary, optimized for each kid down to the concept based on what he or she knows and how she learns best. So that's what you can do at the high end, but it takes a lot of work to wire it up that way. Okay. Uh, back in the corner, there's a question. Uh, my name is Mario Ribello. I'm the head of policy for VMware Corporation. Question for Karen. Based upon the study that uh, Daryl West issued uh, today, what are the policy barriers 
to the Department of Education as well as state <coughs> education uh, committees as well as uh, governing bo bodies to change those policies with respect to sharing of data and sharing information. And what's the timeline that you see the department adopting a policy or encouraging policy to be modified both at the federal and state and local level to make these realities of what she was asked talking about a reality so that we're not waiting five or six years. But given the um, obstacles on information sharing and privacy issues, mm -hmm. how likely and when will the department make those changes? Great question. Right, so yes, very good it's question. <laughs> positive reinforcement. Um, and, and I'll tell you, you know, after uh, working in government, I, I time, you know, <coughs> is the whole different level of different universe. So I actually won't make um, any uh, predictions about time. But um, what I will say is um, it's a really interesting space that I feel like I am, I'm just sort of getting my head around all of the nuances about data and about and about privacy. I would say that the top line is that we need to make sure that whatever we do, we are very cognizant of maintaining student data privacy and, and teacher data privacy as, as, a, as appropriate, right? So there are, there are so many you know, things that could happen and a lot of people say, oh, in the, you know, in the consumer space, in the online world, world like you know, privacy's gone or whatever. We need to make sure we maintain uh, privacy. So a couple things that we're, that we're working on. One is this My Data initiative. So, as, so what we want to do is we want data to definitely go to the end user. So we don't want any policy barriers to say that, I'm sorry, you can't have your data. But if we could get everybody, everybody who has student data, so whether it's the, the Newton platform or the, you know, the, the, the whatever platform is out there, whatever you're using, if you're working with students, interacting with students, put a My Data button on there that says, sure, student, download your own data in machine-readable format so that you can do things with it, you can learn from it. And this actually comes from the, um, the, uh, the, the play that the uh, Veterans Affairs, you know, they did about um, health data. They said the veter veterans have the, um, they have the right to have access to their own health data. So they began to create a blue button, which was this, this My Data button for, for veterans. So if we think about the same thing, if we say edu students, should have access to their own data. There are not necessarily policy barriers. There are, you know, technical barriers, and there are there are thorny thorny technical problems associated with that. But that's the, that is you should have rights to your own data. So that's the first thing. The second thing has to do with moving data from one system to another. So this is sharing data across systems, and to do that without getting putting everybody to sleep in the middle of the afternoon, I'll just say that there are, there's a legal framework that needs to be in place, there's a policy framework, and there are tech, there's a technical framework that needs to be in place. And we're working on um, putting that together so that people can begin to analyze it and make the judgments about privacy, make sure this framework that's been put together um, from a technical standpoint actually maintains um, student privacy. There are definitely ways to do this. There also are... Um, there is, there is um, a lot already that's possible. There, there aren't specific policy barriers associated with um, data that's anonymized, right? So data, data that is um, anonymized and for um, research purposes and the like, that's, that's another, um, another thing that we're really interested in, the, the better, you know, better and better um, ability to anonymize data, to make data available to um, make data transparent so people can do things with it that we haven't done. So another thing that we're doing is working on the um, on looking across the department at data sets that could be published open online for people to have access to and potentially mash up with other forms of data. So when you come upon a very specific policy barrier that you see that you think that we should either know about or maybe we do know about, definitely let us know so that we can begin to like make really like sound, uh, you know, informed as informed as possible judgments about all of these kinds of things. We do, we want to move fast. We want to absolutely empower every you know researcher and, and educator and um, and and also commercial sector to build better and better things. So we need to analyze the the policy barriers that you see. So as you come upon those, definitely let us know. So we're doing a lot of work uh, uh, on different parts of it. Uh, here in the front row, we have a question. <coughs> I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, when people uh, go for my data or researchers go online to see the data, 
uh, how will you explain to them the math involved in the data and what they can use the data for? That's a teachable moment. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have an easy answer for that. People absolutely need to begin to understand more and more about their own data. I think that we as a, as a country, as a society, we need people to understand and we need, we need education. We need to put tutorials right there with it. And we came upon this even, even with when students you know, have access to their own you know, financial data or their loan data. Like, what does this data mean? How do you think about that? Um, what can you do with it? Um, I think we need um, better, good examples of people's use of data, and people need to understand the, the unintended consequences. I think early on you mentioned, you know, people sometimes get nervous about open data sets because what if someone does something crazy with the data? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's something we need, to, we need to pay attention to, and I will just say we need better, better educated populace. Um, we, we're calling it data literacy. We need a populace that is data literate, and it's, and it's students, it's teachers, it's parents, it's policymakers, it's government, it's, it's everybody. And it's a new world, it's a, it's a nascent space, and so like now is the time to build much more data literacy across all segments. If I could follow up on uh, that uh, point, because I think it raises a very interesting question, because like, if we're just talking about student achievement data, like the test scores on an annualized basis, and all the controversies over data analysis, data interpretation, and so on, like Jose is saying we're moving from kind of one data point a year to possibly, did you say millions per day? Yep. I mean, isn't that creating a data quagmire? Um, is he that's interesting. So I, I actually have the opposite take, which is that with more data, it actually becomes easier and requires less um, n analysis by regular folks, right? Because if you've got all of the data sets you're looking at now at a district level, and you're kind of you're teasing through it to find patterns that you can that are actionable that you can do something with, um, we tell students stuff like, "Hey, you're going to fail at your homework tonight." You know how we know that because you're struggling with some concepts that are building up to the concepts that you're going to be taught in your homework tonight. So if you don't know the prior concepts, you're not going to learn these very well. Or because the things that you're learning, to, you know, that you're reading passage next week is highly correlated to concepts you historically always struggle with. So we have a high confidence that you're going to struggle with that. So those are very actionable things. And I think with more data, it actually becomes more obvious and easier to action. There, I just made action a verb. Um, Patty? <laughs> I, that, that's very fascinating to get, the, you know, in, at the student level, and that's great, and I, I'm <laughs> eager to see that new world, but I, we, just, we still do have uh, responsibilities as districts to uh, put teachers in the classroom and, and make sure that uh, the students are taking advantage of all these wonderful new tools. Uh, to your question, how can we do this? Uh, public education part of it, both what we're teaching our kids, but I know there are a lot of reporters who are here. The more you can write about data and uh, when you're writing about schools and use the data and use that kind of analysis, you are educating the public as well. And I'm going to go back to the design issue, that there are ways of designing, and, and I have seen examples of of data systems, data dashboards that are available to the public and to any of us, uh, that, that begin that analysis. Now, they make choices based on what most people will want to see, but through that, you walk through it, and you can drill deeper and deeper, and the more comfortable you, will you become. And we're getting better at that. I think that's a whole new opportunity there in um, helping any of us uh, uh, learn new systems. I mean, I tell everybody, I, I was an English major. That's how I started out life, and here I am a data geek. Uh, you know, it can happen to only anyone. In, <laughs> only in America, though, right? <laughs> Pardon? So, only in America, though. Only so. in America. Other questions? Uh, back there, question. There's a microphone right there. Yep. Yeah, Diana Carla, U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, we've talked about, uh, I'd like to address the tools that are, that are possible to use. With uh, outside of the realm of formal education, there are others who are doing a lot of um, <coughs> examination of how people process information, what, how they learn best. For example, Microsoft and Google do this. They, they have tools that are readily available. And I'm wondering what is being done now 
to see what can be done to marshal those tools from private enterprise so that at least we begin to have a naturalistic understanding of how people learn and then where the categories of learning are, uh, of, of individuals are to, to really process information and move that forward into a formal uh, structure of information. Can I, if I think, if I hear your <coughs> question correctly, I, it, it, you're actually raising something that uh, we haven't really talked about, uh, which is the accountability for uh, all these new opportunities and keeping in mind that the um, uh, individuals who are, uh, uh, you know, putting, putting their skin in the game are our students. So we need to offer these. We need to innovate. We also need to monitor it. And fortunately, the data is there, uh, you know, to monitor, to make sure what we're doing is working, and if it's not, to make adjustments. Uh, is this the, the question you're talking about? Um, you yeah, know, we'll how do we know? About, uh, perhaps how, how private industry, such as Google, is yeah. learning how we as consumers learn from information and then mold or tailor our own learning. And then how could those kinds of data be used in order to better the, the way that people educate and also allow for more individualization of education. Is there something uh -huh. beyond mm -hmm. what the public school sector is doing that perhaps could be marshaled to that end? I see, yeah, the, um, and that's, that's the kind of where I was going, is the research side of it, the research function that when we do things, what can we learn from Google? Uh, that's a research question. How is it working? Uh, I, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, when I, I mean, when I go to Amazon and they make recommendations for me, I sometimes look at it and go, what? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a great system. It's not a perfect system. And, uh, you know, so to be able to learn from them how they modify it when, you know, and they watch it and track it, what, what lessons can we take from it? But we have to be very careful <coughs> when we are trying this out on students that we are also monitoring it and tracking it and learning from it and making improvements. Do you have sure. anything? Yeah. So I just, I, I, I think it's a tremendously interesting time right now because I think that what we're seeing is entrepreneurs coming into education from other sectors. So people who never have been interested in necessarily do, creating or building something interesting for education because it's been a very manual, non-digital process. And so we're seeing entrepreneurs from other sectors come into education. It's a very cool time. Um, lots of opportunities. Um, what we want to do is make sure there's really solid collaborations between entrepreneurs and practitioners and, um, and researchers to, to really, and that's not necessarily three different people, but it's, it's those three, um, that the deep knowledge of, of education researchers and, and researchers, the deep knowledge of, of data and analytics from whatever sector, and the deep knowledge of practitioners bring this together to begin to design and build and dream up New, uh, new abilities, and I think we have a lot to stand on from other sectors. Well, Jose, you're actually doing this. Yeah. How are you doing it? Um, well, so um, we do some of the things Google does. A lot of the things they do aren't applicable to us. Um, Google does a lot of A-B testing and multivariable testing, which is, um, which is transferable in principle. So A-B testing is basically um, the habit of measuring what works best for usage, um, user experience analysis, statistically measured. So you know, they actually measure how many pixels should be in the G. Should it be 49 pixels or 50 pixels? Who comes back more? How long do they stay? They, they're tracking things like that based on how many pixels, or, pixels there are in the G. I'm not sure that they're getting any interesting data at that point, but that's what they, you know, they do it anyway. Um, they have so much data that they can do stuff like that. Um, you know, so we can track. Things like, well, if we present this kind of user experience for this type of student, do they learn more things? Do they spend more time in the system? Do they hit more material and try more lessons and, and learn at a higher level of proficiency? We can measure that. And so we have different user experiences for different types of students. Some students get a very kind of Spartan user experience because they're advanced students, they're dedicated, and that's the most efficient way through the material. Other students get, you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like the happy, shiny version of the user experience. You know, it's got more badges and points and games and game-like elements. Um, 
And over time, we can actually measure what works best for what type of student and slowly turn their user experience into what works best for, for that particular person, for that particular subject matter. So a little bit of what Google does um, we'll be able to do, except armed with a lot, a lot more data. Now, in terms of Amazon, obviously we're a recommendation engine, my company, for, for education. So um, the big difference and what's so exciting about being a recommendation engine for education versus being a recommendation engine for Amazon or for Google. Google is a giant recommendation engine. And as much as we love Google, Google is largely, the product mostly fails. I mean, how many of those links do you click on? You click on three or four of them, right? right? There's 10 pages of links. Most of them are garbage. You know that. That's OK. The product still works great because you know how to use the product. But uh, you know, there's something about that product as a recommendation engine that's failing. And we don't want to replicate that part of it in our recommendation engine. We want all of our recommendations to work. Um, Fortunately, we have a much easier problem than Google because nobody's tagged all the world's web pages down to the sentence for Google. But if they had, there would be no interesting correlations between any of those pages anyway. They're all just independent stuff. And everything in education, every concept, is to some degree predictably correlated with every other concept. And it's knowable in advance. And so if people tag all of their stuff to us, we can produce recommendations that don't fail um, or virtually never fail. And when they do fail, the engine can learn, it can teach itself, and it can not make that mistake again. And that's what we do. Mm-hmm. OK, uh, Christine has a question from our web audience. If we can bring a microphone over to her. Or, excuse me, Stephanie. We have and a, she has her own um, microphone. We have a question from Lawrence Swider, who works with digital media for learning and behavior. And what he asks is, the, the, the promise of real-time feedback in education seems to inch us closer to a mastery learning model. How will grading change? Interesting question. How is all this going to affect assessment and grading? I think, I think Jose kind of addressed that earlier, but I think what happens is this notion of knowing once a semester is, is you know, potentially going to, to completely evolve. I mean, it, some of you have heard me talk before about this notion of a learning positioning system, right? The notion that you could have a, have a system that is like your GPS, you're driving along and it knows where you are, it knows where you're going, it's giving you recommendations about how to get to where you're trying to head. Um, if the same thing, you could do that for, say, the domain of mathematics, right? So here's where you are, here's where you've been, here's what you've learned, here's where you're going, here's what we recommend your course be, you know, make a safe U turn and go back over there and learn this stuff again before you continue on. I mean, there are a lot of sort of, uh, we could take this a long way, but, um, but you know, that's, that I think is, um, is, is partly, um, in, in that case, the notion of a grade that somebody assigns to you that's an external assignment becomes maybe less necessary. Um, I think there's always, I don't know always, there's still definitely a place for um, you know, some sort of a, a, a person to, again, observe your performance and see what you're doing, interact with you. Um, but I think that the, this whole notion of kind of grades is, is potentially... Um, we could move to this much more of a notion of mastery and performance and letting you know where you are and where you've been and where you're going. Again, busting out of this kind of you're in fourth grade and you do this, but rather you're on the field of mathematics and where are you going next? You know, pro- probably, uh, you know, instead of a, a grade for a course, we're going to see more uh, scoring against individual standards or concepts, however they're defined. and. Uh, uh, some of the data systems existing now already have the capacity to drill in and link student performance to individual standards. They're building those systems. So I think the um, reporting of that and the record keeping will, will evolve. Uh, you know, parents will need to be used to it, of course. They want to see that A, B, C, or D, but uh, uh, it will happen. And, and Actually, I my think... doctor is currently doing this on health data. Like, I go in and I get uh-huh. my cholesterol test, and I get a readout saying, okay, you're 10% above the norm for my patients. Although, I don't know who his patients are. Like, is it a bunch <laughs> of 75-year-old guys with high cholesterol? <laughs> That's where privacy comes in. <laughs> they don't want you to know. I, I just say, so to, back, just one more sentence on this, is that, that then you can move to proficiency. So it's not about you got a C, but we're moving on because that's over. It's about you have a little more work to do on this, and you stay in that space and don't really leave it until you can actually be proficient. I think that might be what the mm-hmm. asking the question mm-hmm. was about. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of hype about education big data. So if we flash forward five years from now, which of the things that we're currently talking about are most likely to have been implemented on a widespread uh, basis? Because you know, scalability is the big challenge in uh, all of K to 12, especially. 
<laughs> I, I think personalized learning, and I think all of this, where we're going with all of this is personalizing the environment. And to personalize the environment, we need more information about the person. The person needs more information about themselves. The teacher needs more information about all of their people, all their learners in their, in their classroom. Parents can, can, can do better when they have more information. So all of this leads to this opportunity to personalize what's happening um, and, the, the, and bring in not just different pace and different, different interventions, but also your own stories, your own languages, your own uh, interests to, to really create an environment that is much more personal. So I think that we will see that within the next five years. I think we will have sort of every person with their own notion of who they are as a learner. And I think student agency is going to be hugely improved at that point. Yeah. Jose, what's the most promising thing that will be much more common five years from now? Well, I'm going to agree with Karen um, and say personalized learning. And um, um, uh, so think what that means. You know, in the entire, in the entire education system that we have, um, and it's always been like this, um, shoot, was it, was it Winston Churchill who said, uh, you know, um, capitalism is the worst system of the world except for every other system? Or was it, it was Churchill, right? Or was it Truman? I think it was democracy. Yeah. Democracy? Well, I've, been seen, I've seen it used for both, yeah. <laughs> democracy. Anyway, so the current education system is the worst system in the world except for every other system. Um, you know, it was built in the 1800s, and it's a factory model. It's an assembly line model. Everyone has the exact same thing. Like, they're literally students or just widgets on an assembly line. And that sounds really impersonal and awful, but in fact, it's only because we use those assembly line efficiencies that we drove costs down to the point where the Western world could institute mandatory K-12 education. And Every single thing you enjoy today in the modern world is a result of that. So it was a pretty great thing. I happened to hate it. It was really bad for me. And it was bad for me because it's awful at some level to ask every child in the world, you should figure out all by yourself this monolithic bureaucracy full of arbitrary laws and perverse incentives, arbitrary rules and perverse incentives, and you should just figure out how to, how to survive in that and thrive as best you can. That's a crazy thing to ask a child, and that's what we ask every child. And um, personalized learning is going to end that. The system should adapt to them, and it will. Um, now, here's what it can actually do. A unique study plan, a unique path forward each, each day optimized for that kid. Um, in, it'll, in some cases, it'll be the easiest. In some cases, it won't be. In some cases, we'll, le we'll learn about the child. The, actually, the, this, this exercise over here is, is actually a little, it, this kid will struggle with it a little bit more, but it's better for long-term retention. So that's what the kid's going to get. But whatever it is, it's going to be the deepest long-term um, for that kid. And there's going to be a lot of other ancillary benefits. Who's your optimal online tutor? Um, you know, what... Um, um, what are your optimal study habits? What, um, what should you eat in the morning? You'll be able to keep a, um, a diary. You know, here's what I ate every day for a semester. It turns out when I eat scrambled eggs, I do the best that day cognitively. I learn the most concepts the fastest at the deepest level of retention. We'll be able to tell you things like that eventually. We'll be able to tell you, hey, you know, you're on track to get a B minus in this course, you know, based on the way this teacher's t taught it for the last four years. But if you work another 30 minutes in the afternoon, four days a week, you'll, you'll bring it up to a B plus. We'll be able to tell you an incredible amount of stuff. Uh, right here, uh, near the front, there's a question. Hi, I'm uh, Gary Sai. I was a former teacher, five years um, to a Teach for America. So, I mean, we do a lot of data performances in the class, and I think the key difference for a lot of teachers is that it takes a lot of time to measure that data. And we also have to kind of recognize the split in this conversation where Newton is talking about data outside of the classroom, whereas I think you guys are talking about data inside the classroom. And so you guys are right in that there is this kind of trend in personalized data and analytics for the both of you guys, but more specifically, like where are you guys, where, what, I guess, where do you see hybrid learning models taking off? We have people like New Classrooms, School of One, Education Elements, um, who are trying to personalize education, and it's hard to scale that because data in the classroom is not very granular. It's, it's, uh, it's messy. <laughs> isn't it? And uh, I, I think one of the complicating factors is that to many Americans and their families, school is um, as much a community place and a social place as it is uh, a place where their children learn. And I, I think that brings about some tension, um, not just with teachers, but with parents about, you know, how much individualization do they really want? You know, that they, they like the interaction of the classroom and, and some of these traditions. Um, you know, I think that will happen, and I think a lot of it will be driven by the students themselves. 
uh, because they're very savvy and they bring that into the, uh, the classroom. Uh, and I, I also think that uh, you know, the school leadership can send messages through their policies by trying it out and monitoring it and supporting it and allowing the teachers to see the value in that and the parents and the students as well. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not going to, nobody's going to be able to say we're going to do this and it will happen. It will take some time and it will happen in varying degrees in different places, but it will happen. It's inevitable. I, I can't imagine anything stopping it at this point. I, I just add to that to say two things. One is I think that um, I'm speaking for myself. I'm not talking about in school or out of school. I'm talking about learning. And it takes place a lot of different places. And as we can begin to, to um, can way better connect in school and out of school learning and not say this is where you learn and this is the data we care about, but rather say here's who you are as a learner and let's begin to collect and understand who you are based on lots of kinds of data that are going to be available uh, to you. So, so that's one thing. The second thing is that this absolutely, this kind of learning is fully participatory. So nobody should go away thinking that, oh, this is about students' headphones on, online, working through something so that we can collect a bunch of data and we can tell them where to go next. That is not the visual that you should take away. The visual should be about a very participatory, very engaging, very personal environment whereby you are connecting with other people. You're working on complex projects. You're solving complex problems. You may be working on a team with students from other geographies. You might be working outside of school, inside of school, accessing the tutor that a system tells you is the best possible tutor in this next 10 minutes that you can possibly access. Lots of, so lots of parts and pieces, very participatory, very social, very interactive. At the same time, all of these things um, generating and helping you um, by, uh, by providing to you lots of, kind, lots of data and information. So the notion of blended learning is a, is a funny term right now, I think, because classrooms have always been blended, right? They're a blend of you know, individual work and group work and teacher-directed work and reading a book and all sorts of things. Now we're just adding another element to that and say there's a lot of digital, this is a whole digital environment as well, so we can blend that in now as well to the classroom. And that provides us a lot of new, new opportunities that we just did not have before. So I think that's the interesting thing about blended learning. Uh, there on the aisle, about halfway back, Hi, I'm Todd Kofer. I'm the co-founder of a, of a learning analytics startup based here in DC. And I've been doing my graduate work at Georgetown on big data and education. And I'm interested to hear about um, how you envision parents getting involved now as we move from this reactive uh, you know, two or three times per semester feedback loop to the more proactive real-time approach that I envision Newton and others uh, pursuing down the road. Sounds like parents will be able to give grief to their students on an hourly basis as opposed to once right. a semester. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, just what they want. That we text them and say, pick up the pace, yeah. pay attention. No, I don't know. Uh, we're already seeing some of the, that in early stages. There are um, uh, uh, portals in a lot of districts that parents can um, monitor their students' grades. They know if they turn their homework in the day before. It's nothing nearly as sophisticated as where Newton is going and we can see in the next few years. But that um, uh, process of parents at least getting accustomed to that uh, is, is already beginning. So I, I think it will be um, uh, more of a gradual growth. It won't be all of a sudden <laughs> you have all this information available to you. They're already getting feedback. Many of them already getting feedback every day if they want to. Uh, of course, there's um, uh, that's not true in every district, you know, and that's something we always have to pay attention to that those but resources aren't available everywhere. But there's kind of an impl uh, implication in his question yeah. that students are not going to like this. Like and either a chance. company monitoring them, or the <laughs> teachers monitoring them, or parents having the potential to monitor them. Like, is there a risk of backlash from the students? 
There's a risk of backlash from the parents as well. When I hear we, uh, when you talk about homework, I don't know how many parents are out there, but I, I hear a lot of uh, parents complaining about a lot of homework. So there, there could be um, a That's little bit too much. That's only because they much. can't do it. You know, <laughs> I, that but. could be part of it. But, but it's, it, yeah. I, <laughs> oh, go sorry. ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say this whole notion of parent engagement is really interesting. Parent and family engagement in the past has been let's figure out how to get parents and families to come to school because that's where learning happens and we want to meet you and we want to see what we're doing and we want to talk to you about what's going on. Now we have this opportunity to send learning into the home through these digital means. So when a student comes home and the parent can't help them with their homework, they can get online and help. The parents also can get online and like figure it out and then help the student. The whole, the whole notion that the information can flow to the parents wherever they are, it's, it's a huge opportunity. The you know, moving learning into the home, moving the education experience into the home should be should exacerbate the opportunities for um, parent and family engagement in a, in a really positive way. Uh, there's a qu question right back there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm Allison Robinson. I'm Director of Learning and Development Programs at the Human Rights Campaign. Um, I'm really interested um, in your thoughts about how this cycle works, this cycle of uh, you know, data gathering, uh, mining, analysis, interpretation, and then application to the uh, learning experience, how that works for um, skills-based learning. Uh, so the context here is, uh, you know, we teach, cult we do cultural competence and diversity inclusion training uh, in all kinds of organizational com uh, contexts. A and say that cultural competence is about more than having a body of knowledge, it's about developing a set of engagement skills. So how does how do you measure that? How do you analyze it? And, and how, do you, what's, how do you gather that data and what's the, the usefulness of it? There are, a, there's a lot of work happening right now in uh, developing ways to measure <coughs> things like cultural competence, a lot of the uh, 21st century skills, you know, collaboration and uh, uh, you know, creativity. Uh, it's it's um, it's somewhat in it's not in its infancy. It's in its toddlerhood at this point. But they there are a lot of really good minds looking into ways to measure that with validity and with the kinds of performance uh, that technology is able to capture. You know, so it's, it's so they're very rich assessments, but it is information that you can trust. You can see what it looks like, and when you can see what it looks like, it makes it more, much easier for a teacher to teach it. Uh, I, I think we're going. Some of that is being embedded in um, the uh, common. Certainly, a lot of the 21st century skills are being embedded in the 20 the uh, Common Core assessments that they're working on right now. So. I, I'm really optimistic at uh, what we'll be able to accomplish in filling in um, all of those skills areas. One example, and actually I'd love Jose to weigh in this, and is around, and this isn't the example you use, but something that's hard to measure is persistence. So we know mm -hmm. persistence, grit, you know, whatever you call it, is, you know, people are starting to talk about that more and more about how important that is to, to kind of success in life. Like you need to, to, to um, you know, be able to struggle with hard things and, and persist and, and go at it. And so um, you know, one, of the, one of the next policy briefs that we're doing is to say, how do you measure this? What, what are the emerging ways of measuring those, you know, something like persistence? Um, so stay tuned. Hopefully in the next couple months, we'll have a, a paper like the one we did on educational data mining, um, focusing on evidence around persistence and grit. But as such, I don't know if I can ask a question of Jose, but I would love to know, kind of, can you tell from your data, like, what are the kinds of things that you look at that will help you understand the notion of persistence and help students get better at it? That's a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> well, so we're in early days still, but we're doing some things now, and we have high hopes for the future. The things we're doing now are we're measuring overall activity and effort, so we can measure how much people are trying. Mm -hmm. So when students are struggling, right, are, are they struggling because they're just not trying? Or are they struggling because they're trying a lot, but it's all at the last minute? Or are they struggling because um, they're, they're trying a lot and they're struggling anyway, right? And um, those are all very, very, like obviously different groups and um, with different conclusions. And so we're able to give back to the schools, you know, kind of like a metric around, you know, here's their proficiency, but here, and here's how much they worked, right? So, you know, didn't do any work and not very proficient is, is a lot, in some ways, less worrying than 
isn't, isn't very proficient and did a lot of work. Um, and, um, and so certainly, the, they're, they're candidates for different types of intervention. The one is a candidate for like immediate kind of in, you know, surgical tutoring intervention, and the other is a candidate for a kind of motivational intervention. Um, what we hope to be able to do in the future is just get much more sophisticated about things like that um, and be able to tell things like, so <clears throat> um, to what degree does confidence impact um, persistence um, and, and other things like that? And so we can, we can probably tease out things about confidence with time. So for instance, uh, an example, you give a student a, um, um, a math question, it's algebraic, um, and it's a hard question. Top 14th percentile, only 14% of the population get it right. This student gets it wrong. You give her the exact same question, the exact same concepts, but now it's in a word problem format. Or you give her the exact same question, you give her a couple of warm-up problems first. Now she gets it right. Well, that tells you is that she never had a conceptual problem, because she could get that concept right at that level of difficulty. The problem was a confidence problem, right? And so that's really useful information. Can you imagine, going back to the parent question, imagine telling a parent, hey, your daughter's better at math than she thinks she is. She's a confidence problem. You should know that, right? She should know that. And, um, and to what degree do people opt out because of confidence issues? Like, oh, this problem's too hard, I hate math, I'm getting discouraged, I'm just gonna stop, right? And maybe some people don't because of persistence, but maybe I'm just as interested in the persistence, persistence measurement as, um, I'm, well, the reason I'm interested in persistence measurement is because I wanna be able to figure out how to, how to fix it, you know, how to, how to encourage people who, who lack it um, through these kinds, of, um, these kinds of analyses. I just want, Aubrey, because you asked specifically about cultural sensitivity, <coughs> sensitivity. And, um, you know, a, a low-tech way of getting at that is a really well-constructed student survey. And uh, some of the, actually, the, some of what the Gates Foundation has been uncovering is that student surveys can be pretty accurate uh, assessments of what's going on in a school. Okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question. There's a gentleman right there with his hand up. My name is Frank Dahl. Um, I'm an international consultant. I wander around the world trying to advise governments how to improve their educational system. This is all fascinating, but it would have nothing to do with the reality I'm looking at in third world countries. But to put you right on Churchill, um, being a Brit, Thank you. Churchill actually dropped out of probably the most prestigious school in England in its day. And of course, he came from a very rich family, so he could do anything he wanted, whether he dropped out or not. And he was fairly successful, as we know. But let me get you to the point that I'm trying to make, give it, having given, shared that anecdote. And the point is this. The big missing element in all of this, if we're rushing into new technologies, and I was part of um, the, uh, the systems approach to education in London many, many years ago that didn't work. Educational TV and radio was going to transform the classroom and give us all a marvel. We're, we're moving into very fast into new technologies that are f fascinating for those who play with them. But unless they can be brought to scale, and unless we actually deal with the real issue in society, which is the what I call the poverty donut hole in society, that is why many, many students drop out and don't succeed, because they come from very poor backgrounds. How would you say your technology would deal with some of the issues that we're facing there? And those are perennial issues in every society. I'm not sure that technology has come along, come along to help us deal with those issues. And if we look at any kind of statistics at the moment, educationally, certainly in this country and elsewhere, we'll see that that is an important contributing factor to performance. Performance in learning, performance in achievement, in all the things that we're all about when we talk about measurement and, uh, and assessment and so on and so forth. So how will this get us around that real problem? Because these are socioeconomic issues. Mm -hmm. These are class issues in every society. And I'm not sure we're getting around those with new technologies. In fact, we're actually leaving <laughs> this particular group behind by jumping ahead with new technologies. I was <coughs> wondering whether by throwing that into your into yeah. your discussion, we might not be able to get to some of the issues that are really, really operant in our society at the moment and that we aren't dealing with uh, very quickly or very well. Thank you. Good closing S question here. So you ask an incredibly important question. And I would say first that technology is absolutely not a silver bullet, but education is. And so to the extent that technology can be put in support of a much better education opportunity, 
That's where we need to go, and that's where we're going. The reasons technology supports a better education opportunity is number one, access. So we've talked today about people who may go to a classroom where their teacher isn't, isn't necessarily the best at teaching this particular concept, but there are all these other scaffolded supports for, for understanding something because now you can access things that you wouldn't have had access to. You can access courses that you wouldn't have had access to otherwise. You can access explanations and environments and simulations and, and um, models and visualizations of complex concepts that you wouldn't have had access to otherwise. If you're blind, you don't need a special book. The technology can support your access to, the, to what's on the screen. So the accessibility features support a better opportunity to access education. So as we, feedback loops, that's another thing, right? So technology provides for more rapid and more frequent feedback loops based on a lot of this data that we've been talking about today. So without that technology, students wait to be told what to do next, and they wait for the teacher um, to, as their only feedback point in many cases in many classrooms without technology. So we are not in favor of technology just for technology's sake, but we're in favor of technology to the extent that it can vastly improve the opportunity to learn for all Americans. And that is specifically important for those students who don't have access outside of school. So many children today don't have access to technology outside of school. We like to say, oh, kids are digital natives, they all have access. That's actually not true. And there's a growing gap between what people do with technology and people who learn to use technology for personal empowerment, to help themselves learn, to access information, to access government services or health information or, or the like, that's an, that's an empowered use of technology. And then there's, there's a gap between those people and people who use it strictly for entertainment and maybe light communications. So education is the place that we're going to move people towards using this sort of new world of, of highly, highly um, accessible networked um, infrastructure, content, materials, tools, and the like to support that opportunity to learn? It's a great question. I Equity is unbelievably important. Computer and all of that. Of course, to do all of that, you need more resources. We barely have the resources that we need at the moment to run the system that we have. And those resources are human resources. Budgets are going down. We don't have enough teachers. At least we don't have enough of the right sort of teachers to teach the right, in the right sort of way, the sort of subjects that we need, uh, so that we can give the next, um, the next uh, tranche, working tranche, the next working population, the skills they need to be able to meet a changing world. So if we don't have that, how are you going to ex be expected to do what you're going to do when you need a, an enormous layer of expertise and supportive? resources in order to be able to do that. But this is what really worries me. Sure. You're adding one hurdle on top of another hurdle without even solving the problems that we have now. We need to solve those basic problems first before jumping ahead. And technology is fun, yes, I love it too. It is fun, but it isn't fun for people who never access it, who could never access it, and who probably don't have the resources or the time <coughs> or the incentive or the motivation to access. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump, and Patty, did you want to? Well, I, I was, I, I was <laughs> just going to, I, I was going to agree with, with Karen, but also resources are an issue. But let me, um, in addition to extending the talent of the teacher, which we, we've heard how technology can do that, uh, by helping to provide an equal opportunity to learn. Absolutely. Does that require resources? Absolutely. Um, you know, and that's something, that's a decision we have to make as, as a society. At the same time, another thing technology does provide, and it's where we started this conversation, and that is the data. And once we have a policy that all students are going to learn to this level, and we know what that, we have defined those standards, and we now are able to monitor students more closely to see where they are in that continuum, which, which means it's harder to, for kids to fall out <laughs> and because we can pay attention and we can intervene. Uh, when we see these early warning signs, we can, we can accelerate when kids come to us in kindergarten uh, lacking the skills that their, their classmates have. You know, when we have that data, we know where the children are who need help, we can then get them the help. and 
we can monitor what we're doing to make sure that what we're trying to, to achieve is actually producing results. And if it's not, <coughs> try something new. So um, Jose, we'll give you the final word on technology and poverty. Thank you. So, so um, um, there are exactly two things that information technology does. Every online company you've ever heard of, every software company, does one of two things. Distribution and personalization via data mining. That's it. Every dollar created by Amazon, everybody else, distribution, personalization, that's it. Some companies do both. Many just do one. Um, we have, um, my company does personalization, but we actually do it because we have a strong social mission to increase distribution. In fact, Newton is a double bottom line company. We're trying to, to do well enough in our commercial businesses that we can just give it away to the developing world. So what is the it? The it is the distribution of the materials. We're encouraging as many people to tag content to us as possible, not just the publishers who pay us and the schools who pay us, but practitioners. In fact, we're producing an open platform that we expect to launch late next year, which will be entirely free for the developing world to use. Anybody can go take any content that they own, or Wikipedia, <laughs> YouTube, edX, any content that's available online. And by the way, if you haven't ever done it before, go Google some academic concept, and then click on page five, and see how much free open content you get from teachers and professors. It's all unusable because it's like a purple font and like you know green <laughs> background. But they copy; they can. They'll be able to copy paste that for free to us, um, to our platform, and make it adaptive. They'll have the full power and functionality of everything we do for free on not just the content that they put in there themselves, but in any content they find. It's like it'll be the world's you know it's this huge treasure trove of free content. Now all you need in the developing world for students who have no access to to school at all is an iPad and broadband. And I know the team in Google who's providing broadband for like all of Africa. So people are solving the broadband bad problems, and there's going to be cheap, cheaper and cheaper tablets. You know, online education is going to be a godsend to the developing world. God, online education has a chance to, to deeply impact poverty globally, because education has been like the unfair advantage the Western world has had, because the infrastructure on education is immense. Now think about how the developing world went right to landline telephony. Why? Because, I mean, to cell phone telephony. Why? Because landline telephony is expensive. Landline telephony costs nothing compared to the infrastructure of education. So why does, why does only 78%, I mean, why does only 22% of the world uh, complete high school? You know, or 54% or of the world complete sixth grade or equivalent, right? It's because um, education infrastructure is expensive. Now, if in the short term, developing world countries can skip right to online education and get kids who don't have any education at all, um, the best teachers in the world on archive video, or in some cases live video, and the best software in the world, and, and you can measure what content is the most effective for kids just like that and give them that content. Well, that beats the heck out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And if you blend that in with, you know, they still go to the local school one day a week or two days a week or whatever they can afford, the country can afford, right? And you, you know, you've got, you've got a very strong education system that grew up and that just obviated the whole unfair advantage the Western world had. And I believe online education is absolutely, it is the only thing that will solve the global education crisis, access crisis, and that is the key to solving global poverty. Well, we're going to close on that very optimistic note, and I want to thank Jose, uh, Patty, and Karen for sharing your views with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>